So I'm now on slide one of the ventilative cooling design principles uh, presentation. My name is uh, Guilherme Carrillo da Graça. I'm a professor at the University of Lisbon. I was an Annex 62 participant along with all the colleagues uh, that Hilde just mentioned. Uh, I'll be doing two presentations, short ones, this afternoon. So the first one is about ventilative cooling design. And uh, the second one will be about a particular application of ventilative cooling to kindergartens in the city of Lisbon. It was done uh, in my consultancy company um, a few years back. Uh, the slides I'll be showing uh, are a result of my own experience and my own ideas and also, of course, uh, results uh, from, from our annex work and work I did more closely with Per in one of the, the of the later tables that I'll be showing you, Per Eiselberg. And so I hope you enjoy this short uh, presentation. Just a second, slide two. So what is ventilative cooling? So ventilative cooling is the application of the cooling capacity of the outdoor airflow by ventilation to reduce or eliminate uh, the energy demand for mechanical cooling in buildings. So ventilative cooling is a ventilation-based method to obtain cooling effect in buildings. This could be any type of building, although I'll focus more on service building, office buildings, schools, etc. But of course, this applies to all types of buildings. Uh, ventilative cooling uses the cooling potential of cool outdoor air. The, air the airflow driving force can be natural, so it would be natural ventilation or also mechanical ventilation uh, when there is no active cooling in the, in the mechanical uh, system. So we have just ventilation, that's also ventilative cooling, or a combination of natural and mechanic where we have a hybrid ventilative cooling system. Uh, the most common ventilative cooling technique is daytime ventilation. Uh, even more simply, open the window. And also, nighttime ventilation for uh, internal mass cooling, again, uh, to, um, to open the, the windows. Um, all right, so uh, what's the context? Uh, we are in a context where uh, ventilative cooling is underused. Uh, on the right side, this figure, on this figure, you can see a, a map of California where you have are the amount of time during the day where you could cool a, a workspace with ventilative cooling. Okay, and the, and the, the green colors show values of around 80 percent towards San Diego, LA on the, on the coastal region uh, of California. So this is kind of an interesting example. This is work done by Nun Martins, uh, who is a, a former PhD student of mine, and he looked at these potentials in different regions of the world. Now, as you, as you know, most of you know, that in offices we have uh, two uh, energy consumption areas where ventilative cooling can be very important by eliminating these consumptions or reducing them. And they are mechanical ventilation. We have a lot of ducts in buildings and you have a lot of fan power to move the air in the ducts in and out of buildings that are purely mechanically ventilated with narrow uh, flow paths for the air, the duct work from the HVAC system. So on the one side, you have a ventilation load that's, that can be very significant. It can be similar or larger than lighting load, so the, lo the, the energy consumption for lighting. <clears throat> and then in addition to this ventilation load, you have a cooling system load. So both of them contribute to an overall energy demand that in some buildings, modern offices can go as high as 50% of the total energy consumption, okay? Now, if you were to do a, an ex a state of the art, and if you can do a state of the art ventilative cooling in a given application, um, you can reduce the energy consumption uh, of, of an office uh, up to half, where the other half would be lighting, computers, and so on, uh, but you could remove the HVAC part of the load. Now, uh, the, the, the interesting thing or the sad thing 
is that we used to have offices that were very suitable to ventilative cooling. This is one example here on the slide where you have very tall ceilings, uh, great capability of the indoor air to take the heat, exposed thermal mass. You can have pollutants accumulating at high levels. So this would be wonderful for ventilative cooling. But we actually have uh, moved on to a situation where you have these high density offices that have a, a very low floor to ceiling height. This is an image here. Of a, of, a, of a certain type of modern office where you have no exposed, no significant exposed thermal mass. You have a raised floor, uh, a false ceiling, so a lowered ceiling, and then you have facades that are fully glazed and, and have a lot of, of solar gains. And, and as you as we'll see in a few minutes, high loads are not, high thermal loads are not an area where ventilative cooling can excel. For ventilative cooling, we, we need appropriate outdoor air conditions and low internal loads. And, and the modern offices, of course, are quite difficult. Uh, the other problem we, we sometimes face with modern architecture is the, again, a lot of glazing, but even clear glazing, like this example, where you have, this is Japan, a fully glazed building where inside there is so much radiation and light that people can't even work properly and they have to build these shelters, right? And so this building has uh, excessive heat gains internal due to solar mostly. And again, would be very hard to do ventilative cooling. Not that it has very nice operable windows either, but I would see it as an extreme example, okay? Now, when we think about a ventilative cooling system, and here I'm still in my own uh, slides and I haven't gotten into the annex. I have to be quick. Uh, I just want to leave this idea out there. How are people designing ventilative cooling systems? Now, ventilative cooling systems are usually used in buildings with heat internal uh, uh, sensible heat gains of 20 to 30 watts. Okay, and you have opening areas in the in the rooms that are that use ventilative cooling in this case by opening windows okay that are that range between 1% and 10% how is this percentage obtained we add the inflow and outflow uh, window or opening area because you can also do natural ventilation with chimneys and other uh, devices that let flow and outflow areas and we divide by the room area and you get a percentage of ventilate the uh, ventilation area okay and we can see here three ranges of what we find in designs uh, and even in regulations like some regulations when a building has natural ventilative cooling they require uh, at least five percent opening area okay and so we have three ranges for winter and the indoor air quality, one to 2% window open area uh, scaled by the room floor, of course. As you want to have some cooling in mild outdoor environments, note that we're always in buildings that range in internal loads between 20 and 30 watts. If it's higher, this doesn't often doesn't work, okay? So in, the, in those cases, with three to 5% window open area to floor, you can get cooling up to 25 outdoor, and then you can go up to 10% if you want maximum cooling capability. Uh, we have to be careful that to do ventilative cooling in a building, we should not transform our building into an outdoor space by opening the window so much that you lose the function of the building as a sheltered place. So there are limits here, okay? Um, how do people do ventilative cooling? Do they use wind or stack? So this is also a relevant point in my opinion. And that is that of course, stack, chimney effect, thermal effect, so ventilation driven by temperature differences is much weaker than wind driven ventilation, but is much more reliable because every time I have an internal load, I know my driving force is there, okay? So when we use wind, we have to make sure wind does not counteract the stack and we should design for the worst case scenario, which is 
no wind. So most systems need to be designed for stack. That I think that's a relevant point. I am now a bit afraid that Maria will cut my time. Just one more minute to say that we have some very interesting information in all of the Annex outputs, of course, and in particularly about uh, design uh, ideas, how to design. Uh, this is work coordinated by Per Eiselberg. And in this book, you can find, in this PDF really available, you can find a very good discussion of the design phases of, a, of an appropriately thought out ventilative cooling design. Okay. And you can also find some interesting design tables for early evaluation of the need for mechanical support on the ventilative cooling system. So do we need a fan or not? And you can go through these tables and um, assess the need. And you can also have an assessment for the need for supplemental cooling. OK, I'm almost done. These tables, I, I didn't give you any time to look at them, but I will go come back to these tables when I show you my, my kindergarten design example, where you can see uh, the tables in application. OK, so what we're going to do when we get to the kindergarten is we're going to go to table eight and we are going to go to table nine, OK, slide 13 and slide 12. And in these tables, we will fill. I'll show you the filling out of this of these tables and what were the predictions about the need for a fan or the need for supplemental cooling in that design. OK, I'll take the, the, the two minutes I still have to explain the fields of this sort of ventilative cooling diagnostic system that we developed that should not be confused with the next present presentation where you will look at the climate potential in detail. So Anna Maria will show you another approach of evaluating where you look at the suitability of the climate for your building. In this case, it is not as detailed in that sense, but it looks a little bit more into the overall uh, context of your project. And so going through the table, we should uh, understand that uh, uh, no, N means no, M means maybe, and Y means yes. And when, whatever you fill out here, you don't need to fill out all the, all the points. You, you can only be in the blue spaces here. And then I'll show you the example soon. But the point is, after you do this, you can do an average value. No is one and yes is five. And so you get a number that will on average tell you whether you are more in a context where you need fan assistance or not. So if your number is below three, you are more in the range of not needing. The average number of all these questions here or the ones that apply, by the way, you don't have to, to, to respond to all. And if you were towards five, you need fan assistance. And in what regards? the additional, in the need for additional cooling, the same applies. You fill out along the blue bits of the table and you do an average uh, value. And with this assessment, you can get a first idea about two significant questions about ventilative cooling. So the first one on slide 12, the previous one is, do I need a fan to supplement my natural inflow and outflow system? Okay. And then, of course, the second question is, is, going, is ventilative cooling going to be enough for the building application? It is in early design. Uh, so this is meant to provide us with a starting point. And then, of course, as you refine the design uh, along these principles shown here on slide 10, you need to iterate. So you start with initial concepts about the design and then you test them with simulation. And perhaps you need to go back to the drawing board to improve the design. And so, of course, this is an iterative process that uh, doesn't end until the building is in use and you are able to uh, clearly establish that it's working as expected and does not need additional uh, enhancements or changes. Because, of course, every building is a prototype. So it's not. it can happen that we need to adjust. Uh, thank you very much for your time.